Hi everyone and welcome back to the virtual Benedetti sessions and episode four of Ask Your Tutors. I'm Ruth and I'm here with Jenny Lewison and together we are the Benedetti Foundation team Viola. Uh, today we're delighted to welcome cellist Robin Michael and violinist Elena Uriosti. We have received some fantastic questions from you on a performance related theme and it's wonderful to have Elena and Robin here to answer them for you. Um, so, Robin, maybe I'll start with you for this first question. Um, what is your pre-performance routine to get in the zone? Right. Um, first of all, I should apologise for the rather miserable picture of Shostakovich behind me, which my children <laughs> somehow um, have managed to make as my backdrop for Zoom, and I can't get rid of it. It's. Um, I hope you appreciate the, his sentiments, um, but they're certainly not mine. Um, <laughs> so, pre-performance rituals. Um, I don't like bananas, but I always, always have a banana or two before I play. And I can't eat them any other time, but for some reason, it's the only thing I want to have before a concert. Um, I mean, I used to, when I was younger, be sort of, uh, you know, have, have all sorts of, want to have a certain amount of time, sleep, all these sorts of things and but as you get older um particularly in the well what was the mad music profession before it all <laughs> came to a shuddering halt eight weeks ago it's actually not possible to to have uh, all the time a, a set routine but certainly you what i don't like to be playing right up until the concert i think that's one of the the, the things that i try to be absolutely uh, strict about because you need at least I need time to sort of come down from the rehearsal um, just absorb everything that's happened and then focus on the concert and if I don't have enough time to do that my brain is still a little bit scrambled when I then go in and it's a very you know even a rehearsal on the day of a concert is a is a completely different thing to the concert itself mm. so i just need some time um a corner where no one's bothering me uh, a, a space where there are no mobile phones and mm. a banana great and is there anything kind of cello warm-up specific that you tend to do like what you sort of do with with your instrument before you go on stage yeah absolutely i mean i think everybody and i, I don't know if um elena's the same but as again, as you get older and, and when you're at conservatoire level, you, you learn all the studies, but with the cello, it's, it's popper, it's dupor, it's piatti. But I think as you get older, you manage to refine everything down to maybe 10, 15 minutes of what you actually need physically to feel at your freest. Um, mm. no matter if you're, if, if you're, uh, you can be actually feeling inside a little bit uptight about the concert. But you, you know, you have a, a few certain exercises or studies. I, I mean, I can tell you what they are. Um, I have two proper studies that I play numbers two and six in various different ways, which for some reason they just seem to get everything sort of feeling uh, fluid. Scales, obviously, um, and that that to me, I've, I've you know, five ten minutes of that, and I'm ready to go normally um mm -hmm. i certainly as, as i said I, I don't like practicing too much the day of a concert if i am uh, you know, if i am practicing i'll do everything under tempo and i used to be sort of superstitious and, and sort of have to play every single note that I was going to play in the concert under tempo i'm a bit too old for that now and certainly <laughs> with pieces i can just about trust myself with um, but i certainly don't go hell for leather um at all uh on the day of a concert yeah okay so like rest is quite an important aspect for you then and then yeah, rest yeah and also for me i mean i i'm quite a keen runner so um i mean i'm i, I will always try and run early on in the morning certainly mm -hmm. i've had some some bad experiences of running too close to the concert um but sometimes if your heart's going far too fast you still haven't sort of calmed down so I try and do that and actually one time where I went on a run that was far too long and was playing 
all three Schumann trios. And halfway through the second trio, I knew that my energy levels had just, I had nothing, nothing left whatsoever. That was quite a long time ago. So I know now that if I'm going to exercise, it has to be in the morning. Uh, and that normally you get the benefit of that in the evening. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Thank you. And um, Eleni, can I put the same question to you? What what your pre-performance routine to get in the zone is? Absolutely. Robin, I also hate bananas, but I, I also... Oh, great. Choke, yeah, I choke one down before... Um, <laughs> Before the more nerve wracking, I think it's probably like a placebo effect at this it's point more than anything absolutely. else. Absolutely. But I do, I don't, I, I do believe that the potassium is helpful and that there are yeah. natural beta blockers in them. But um, I predictably um, do a lot of yoga to prepare. If I'm um, in a in an unfamiliar city, I always seek out nearby yoga studios to see if they offer something that um, I'd be interested in. So ideally. Um, Sometime that day, preferably in the morning as well, I'll go to a class. If there are no studios around, I'll just do some in my hotel room. I almost always um, travel with my my little skinny travel mat. Um, so I've always got something in my hotel room. Um, I, depending on the piece, um, if it's a if it's a concerto that really freaks me out, I probably will go through and just make sure I've played every note. Usually, so far away from the from the actual tempo, I'm. Um, all about like very slow, methodical practicing. So I probably won't play anything up to tempo on the day unless I've had a dress rehearsal. Um, and then closer to the performance, I will take a nap. Um, napping is very important to me. Um, I try and eat well that day, things that will sustain me. Um, although in certain parts of the U.S. that can be quite difficult. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, take a long shower, do my hair, do my makeup. Um, and then when I get to the dressing room, I go through a series of um, sort of yoga, but stretches, um, make sure my hands and arms and neck, shoulders, everything feels good. And then I've got my, my violin warm up routine. It sounds hideous, but it works for me. Um, a bunch of left hand plunky things, some Schrodick, some Kreutzer, um, lots of open strings, breathing with my open strings to make sure everything is kind of synced up within my body. Um, I'll go through tricky parts of the um, tricky passages in the piece just to make sure I, I'm as calm as possible. Um, and then I just breathe. Um, I try and I do like to play kind of up until I go on stage, but at some point in the half an hour before um, I make my way to the stage, I will definitely just spend a few moments breathing. So mm. that about sums it up. Oh, and yeah, banana and I choked down about 45 minutes beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you just can't beat a banana, can you? Um, Jenny, do you have any anything you'd like to add in about your pre-performance getting in the zone? I suppose all I, all I wanted to sort of maybe add was that sometimes that zone can feel really elusive, can't it? Even though you do all of your pre-performance stuff, sometimes it, even in spite of that, it can feel totally like you're not centered and totally like your mind is going all over the place so what i found really helps with that it's a classic but just to think about the music think about what's on on the page what you're trying to communicate and if you just have that as your number one goal and feeling it is amazing how your attention can just kind of come back um that's yeah. what i've found it doesn't always work and that's okay too <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's really helpful because i think i think a certain amount of um flexibility is so important isn't it because so often we find ourselves in situations that aren't totally ideal and you don't necessarily have the time that you would have liked or the, the space that you would have liked to do a routine so some it can sometimes be helpful to be flexible about what you what you need and I just add to that sometimes those experiences wind up being the best because you haven't had the chance to kind of psych yourself up and like invent imaginary problems you just have to I found like if I'm in a rush or if I've been feeling sick like physically ill sometimes those are the best concerts because you don't have the space to like invent these mm. imaginary issues you just have to like yeah. get it done and somehow the, the the human body and the human spirit is amazing it just knows how to power through yeah yeah how about you totally. Yeah, I mean, the same thing. A banana is a big one for me and slow work scales, breathing. I, try, I, I do, I like to take some time before going on stage to think about what it is that I'm trying to convey and what it is that I want to 
send out to the audience. And I find that kind of thinking of the direction of the energy that I want to send is really important to me. Mm-hmm. But also trying to remember that, as Lena said, that it's not always about what, the, what you do just before you go on stage and trying to sort of hold on to that as well. Um, great. So let's carry on to question two then. So maybe um, I'll go the other way this time. I'll start with you, Elena, with this one. Um, and this question was, have you ever had performance related injuries? And if so, how did you manage them? So I'm not sure that this was caused by playing or performing, but I definitely had an injury that then inhibited my playing. So when I was in my second year um, at conservatory at, um, at Curtis, I started having this weird sensation in my in my right arm from my elbow to my fingertips where it it went numb, but like not fully numb, but it's sort of like uh, when, when your leg or arm falls asleep, before it starts tingling, that sort of like dull, hot emptiness, like I would always be going like this, like trying to get blood to go to the area, but it, it didn't work. And I had no idea, this is way before I started doing yoga. So I didn't really have any idea of what my body was supposed to feel like or supposed to do. I was using it just as like a garbage disposal for, for all kinds of, you know, terrible college food, um, not getting enough sleep, all of that, just generally being unhealthy. But I didn't have any idea what the problem was or how to fix it. I finally, at the suggestion of a friend, went to see a rolfer, um, which, to be honest, I'm not totally clear on what it is even today, but I think they, they work, they manipulate the connective tissue. So that's like tendons and ligaments and, and that, that sort of, um, uh, those sorts of structures in the body. And eventually it kind of resolved itself, but without me really knowing how or what to do to prevent it. Um, then fast forward 10 or so years later, started doing yoga. I haven't had any recurring energy uh, injuries. <laughs> I have had recurring energy, not recurring <laughs> Um Sorry, the coffee still hasn't kicked in yet. <laughs> um, but... So I did feel that sensation come back one time. Um, I was playing some concerts in Texas, and I was at a um, kind of pre-concert reception, and someone in the someone mingling noticed that I was doing kind of all of these weird things with my arm, and he he came over and sat down next to me and was like, "Are you experiencing numbness in your in your ring finger and pinky?" And I was like. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. How did you know? And he was like, oh, I just saw the way you were moving your neck. Anyway, we got to chatting and he he suggested that it might be something called thoracic outlet syndrome, which basically means that a nerve in your neck is compressed. And I started kind of poking around in there and I like felt this zing. I was like, oh my God, that's it. I feel it all the way down my hand. So what probably happened was I fell asleep on a plane like this, like way back when I was in school or like passed out in a weird position, compressed a thing in my neck. And because I didn't quite know how to, you know, stretch my neck, um, it just persisted and playing made it much worse. Sitting down made it much worse. Um, But yeah, thanks to that guy, actually more than the rolfing, I I now know to look out for that, to be careful with my neck, always stretch it out. Notice if I've, you know, fallen asleep like this with everything smushed. Um, Yeah, so that's my injury story. Wow. wow, that's amazing. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. That's really interesting. Um, and Robin, can I put the same question to you? If you have you ever had performance related yeah. injuries? Absolutely. And, and actually, I went for a rolfing session. That's why I reacted um, when Elena mentioned it, because it was probably one of the most painful things that I've yeah. ever had sort of manipulated. Um, yes, I was in my late, mid to late 20s. When I left... Um, conservatory um i played a lot of contemporary music and i did a tour where for i think eight out of nine or ten nights i played a zanakis solo cello piece called kotos which is a it's an extreme workout lots and lots of down bows incredibly loud it goes on for 15 it's an extraordinary um uh, it's an extraordinary thing to to be um to listen to um much less so to play it's it's incredibly demanding physically and at that age i i mean it would it, it you really do feel it even even if you're practicing it slowly and to do it night after night i was in denial about the pain 
that I was feeling because at that age you think, well, I should be invincible. That I'm sure it's just, you know, I made the mistake after. I mean, I really, I, I really had problems actually in, in terms of uh, being able to hold the bow and, and tension because of this piece. And I went to sports physiotherapist who probably for any sporting injury would have been fantastic but of course didn't understand at all what we as musicians actually how we use our bodies and I was misdiagnosed and compounded the problem and it, it, I, I remember it so vividly um, a concert where I was playing Beethoven Open Chairs and I, I was moving my arm basically willing my hand to be able to uh, you know awful awful and i i kind of got through the concert on painkillers and just said to myself stop can't do this and fortunately i mean this this is the one thing that i it'd be good to talk about and and it's nice that this is such an open forum because it's a real taboo subject maybe less so now with younger generations about musicians injuries because i think certainly when i was younger the older generation if you had an injury it was a sign of sort of some sort of weakness or technical deficiency which absolutely isn't the case unfortunately i was at the time working with a violinist who had a similar thing and he put me on to musician's hand specialist catherine butler who is an amazing lady works in london and she straight away went to see her and she knew exactly what the problem was exactly where the problem was like as elena's point that the thoracic um nerve there usually when you have a problem lower down it because of her pain somewhere in the in the back somewhere in the shoulder and of course that's we, we immediately think about where the actual where the point of the pain and the source and um it took me i'd say it wasn't long it was two or three months of treatment with her but she told me something that's, that was very interesting and i even reacted to elena's story that our nerves our muscles they have memory of pain so once we've had uh, an experience of something like that that any sort of memory of that can 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 really jolt them back into thinking no, no no we don't want that to happen again so looking after yourself is incredibly important but also seeking advice um i i would say to anyone who has pain or there's some sort of problem speak to people about it don't keep the problem to yourself don't think it's necessarily it, it might be a technical thing it might be something you can sort through but don't keep it you know don't sort of suffer on on your own because what i didn't realize was how many people in the music profession had lived had got through um experiences like that um you know i wonderful cellist who passed away um, just a few weeks ago, Lynn Harrell. He was actually the principal at the Royal Academy when I went there as a student, very short-lived period. He was only there for, for a year or so. But at that time, actually, he had hand surgery. And I remember him talking to him about it. And he, you know, various reasons that, that, that it come to that. But I remember him telling, and I should have heeded, taken his advice. He said, you know, it's always, you have to share these things. Don't ever suffer on your own. Yeah. Rowan. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. That's such amazing advice. And I think I think that's just so helpful for young musicians entering the profession to hear that because it is really important that we that we discuss it openly. Um Jenny, do you have anything to add on that question? No, I think that is that says it all really. Um I think the yeah, other thing to add is is just that of course by not voicing it you end up with this burden in your head and of course that brings even more tension into your body and it just makes things worse. So so to have the psychological relief of sharing your burden also helps just in in and of itself. But absolutely yeah and then I mean the other piece of advice I think is always um always taking the time to warm up your body as well and to, to treat your body really carefully and to spend that time, even if it might mean three minutes less time on a, on a piece that you're playing or, or whatever it is that you're working on, it's worth taking that time to help prevent injuries from happening. But obviously if they are happening already, then there is help that you can get and people that you can talk to. Yeah. Great. So we do question three. Um, so I will start this time with Robin then and then go to Elaine. I think that's right. Um, so Robin, how do you go about finding the ideal setup of your instrument to suit your own body? That's a really good question. Um, 
setup. It depends very much. I mean, okay, so I'll um, I play I'd say half the time with a modern setup in steel strings, and half the time using uncovered gut strings, usually 18th, 19th century music, maybe using a classical bow. So actually, my instrument that I have it's a modern cello. It was made for me in two thousand and ten by a wonderful luthier in Paris, Stefan von Baer. And actually, I have it set up so that I always have gut strings in the bottom two bottom strings and then I change the two top strings between steel and gut depending on who I'm playing with what I'm playing repertoire um, and the sound post is is at a tension where it works for both um, and I, I can say I mean it depends on some instruments misbehave more than others but um, I had a my professor when I was at the academy Colin Carr um, and he would, I'm sure he'll admit this, and I, I'm going to say this publicly, but he, he was completely paranoid about setup, about his instrument being open. He would carry in his suitcase on tour um, a Bunsen burner and stuff for making glue so that he could, yeah, I, and clamps. Wow. Um, wow. If he hears this, he's never going to forgive me. And also two or three bridges that he could fit himself. And I also know a certain luthier who actually, in the end, refused to ever answer his calls because it would be the most minor thing. And um, I, there's a certain point where you just have to... I mean, I'm lucky with my cello that I know if there's a problem, it's usually my fault. But I'm not doing something as well as I could do. And that's actually very reassuring to know. Um, I think what's, what I'm getting more and more interested in as I get older is the, actually the relationship you have with the bull and how different bows can pull such a different sound from an instrument. And just tell you a, a quick story about, in fact, that there's, there is one bow in the world that I covet um, more than any others. And in fact, Jenny's partner, um, Bart, uh, knows this bow as well. It's a turret that a friend of mine um, has in Munich. And there was an evening where there were a number of cellists together, and there were a number of extraordinary cellos in the room. There's a Strad, there was other things. But actually, no matter which cello was being played, it was the cello that was being played with this tour that sounded just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And um, what I think is good now for younger musicians, well, for any musicians, because, you know, to buy a tour, you need um, a considerable amount of money, is that there are some extraordinary young bow makers, actually, who can really produce the architecture of, of what Turt was doing and makers around this time. And I think people sometimes spend too much time focusing on the actual instrument itself and not and not how the bow works with an instrument, mm. because you can uh, that that relationship changes with every single different um, you know different different bow. Um, so that's what I'm I'm interested in with now. And I also I got I got over the bug quite when I was quite young about wanting the best old instrument because I saw colleagues, I mean, I was lucky enough to find a maker who I just, I tried an instrument of his and I just fell in love with it completely. But I saw people who would try and get on the ladder and the problem is when you get that one instrument, you're always wishing, you're always trying. And, um, you know, there has to come a point where you you, you find something that that is I mean, it sounds a bit cliched that is your own voice and that you trust. Um, and that's, that, that's different for everybody as well. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, Elena, do you have some tips for finding the ideal setup of instrument to suit your body? Yeah. So I actually interpreted the question in a slightly different way, which was not so much the, how the instrument is set up, like sound posts and um, the equipment itself, but actually how then, that equipment fits into your body. Um, like, like Robin, I also like, I've never really had the instrument bug. I'm, I'm not like, uh, an equipment geek at all. I totally respect people who are, who are interested in like what happens if you move the sound post like this and different, like I change my strings maybe once a year and like yeah. rate my bow every year and a half. It's like actually kind of irresponsible, but, um, that sort I, and I always feel like, I actually forget that you can do these things and it will probably make you sound better. Whereas I'm at home puzzling like, God, why can't I make a sound? And it's because my bow hair is like two years old. Um, so I think like a certain amount of attention to your equipment is good, but yeah, there, 
it's it's a da- it's a slippery slope. Like it's so easy to get instrument envy and instrument lust, and there's there's always going to be something more magical out there. But I think if you can if you can make you know as beautiful and invested a sound on your own equipment as you can, and then if you get the chance to play something you know really sparkly, use it as a teaching tool for yourself. Like oh oh yeah, when I when I stroked that instrument like this that's how it felt in my body. And maybe I can bring that back to my own equipment. Um, but with regards to how, because I like when you said setup, I instantly thought, um, shoulder rest and, and yeah. stuff like that. Um, yeah. which is actually a conversation I've had with Nikki a lot. Cause I know she experiments with quite a few things. I had one of those, um, very militant old school teachers when I was 13 years old who, or 12 years old, who was basically like, you've got a week to get that thing off. Like no, no shoulder rest when you show up here next time. And I was like, okay. Um, not understanding why that was important or a thing. Um, and to be honest, I still don't, I do not understand people who get all bent out of shape about people using stuff to make playing the instrument more comfortable. I just think it is the stupidest, most destructive thing in the world. If you want to use a shoulder rest because it feels good in your neck, if you want to hold your, you know, you, no one can tell you how it feels to be in your body. And this is like, I, it always comes back to yoga for me. Building an awareness of what feels good and what feels bad in your body is so key to playing an instrument. Um, because, you know, some, if someone tells you to, to, put your arm in a certain way or, you know, smush the instrument up into your chin in a certain way. It's only you that's going to suffer. So I think we all as musicians have to cultivate our bodies and, and cultivate a strength in our voice to say like, actually, this doesn't feel good. I need this to, um, to feel more comfortable. Well, of course, being open-minded and trying a bunch of things. Um, but anyway, yes, I had this very militant teacher who, who gave me a week to get my rest off it happened to work for me. Um, I haven't played with a shoulder rest since I was 12 or 13, and it it feels good in my body. It actually, for me, having a shoulder rest was masking a lot of my tension. So my rest would pop off all the time, and I and I didn't. It didn't occur to me that it was actually because I was squeezing so hard with my shoulder. So taking it off um, shed light on just how squishy I was being in my upper half and kind of forced me to to examine in a in a cool headed way um, what exactly was going on with my shoulders so for me it works for people for other people it doesn't work I I think experimentation is key open-mindedness is key patience is also key because no change is going to feel comfortable right away so you have to give it at least a couple weeks to see whether this is something that might um but I would say um, that just going back to the the warm the physical warm ups and nurturing preparing your body that is the best way to cultivate an awareness of what will then feel comfortable on the instrument because if we don't quite know what a good relaxed neutral feels like um, without the instrument we're only going to kind of grow around our instruments in weird ways um, if we're if we're being you know servants to the instrument we have to learn to bring it to us in the most relaxed way possible absolutely yeah and I, if i could add just something to that thinking about the actual body setup with cellists i would just it's so always so interesting the shoulder rest debate for me because for us it's it's the spike and i would even if the, you don't play on garter play the baroque cello try playing without a spike just to to, mm-hmm. to feel how because actually, if you look at the older pictures of how cellists like Romberg played and how they held the cello without a spike, we can learn a lot about posture and also how actually your lower back has to work in a way that it should be working and, and support. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I mean, when I see there are certain cellists out there with these massive long spikes, and it just it defies all. I mean, I, I'm putting my cards on the table here, but it does it defies actual um, gravity also. Because you should be centered onto the instrument, not being pushed back by the instrument, even though the higher positions might feel easier for the left hand to play. You're actually having to work much harder with, with, with this. Um, so try and just, just feel, it will probably feel very weird, but do spend a bit of time, particularly if you're working on repertoire like, like Bach's DPE Beethoven, 
just to see because the music was written for people who were playing in that way and i think it's good for us to just have a bit of received knowledge about how that was yeah amazing thank you so much uh, to you both jenny do you have anything that you want to add there to what i've like set up um only that um if you see someone like sitting around you in an orchestra and they have a really funky looking shoulder rest or something don't be shy go up and ask them what it is and try it because sometimes like strings in particular and shoulder rest all that stuff is like prohibitively expensive to to buy one just in case you might like it so the more you can just ask people to try stuff you'll be surprised i think how how open people are to discuss all that particularly if it's a weird and wonderful one they'll have gone into some um journey themselves probably to have found it so yeah that's all i would add amazing well thank you so much to to you guys for giving up your time to talk to us and to answer those questions Pleasure. and thank you so much to the ambassadors who sent them in they're really amazing questions and i'd just like to thank you for your honesty yeah robin <laughs> if there's one last thing just about setup and, and it's this is a little funny anecdote but one thing to try and avoid uh, one of my close friends Catherine Manson who's the violinist in the London Harden Quartet she had to borrow a mute for a concert she'd forgotten her mute at a concert of late Beethoven quartets and somebody had a funky sparkly mute which she thought oh well, that's fine and she didn't even think about the fact that it was a, a funky sparkly mute and they played this concert of opus 127 and opus 132 incredibly deep music and afterwards, she said every single person who came to speak to her at the end, all they wanted to talk about was the mute. Uh, girl. <laughs> so annoying. No, there you go. So just. There you go. <laughs> oh, amazing. Well, thank you so much. And yeah. I think we'll just say goodbye and thank you. Thank you so, so much, everybody. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye -bye.